Would your organization benefit from a global network of reseller partnerships? In a time when marketing budgets are shrinking and global economies are in turmoil, having resellers on the ground in various regions and countries who have already established a trusted relationship with your target audience is a real asset. But such a network isn't tossed together overnight. Where do we start? And how do we grow and scale reseller partnerships to levels like what Snap's accomplished? That's what we're covering in today's episode of Partnership Unpacked. This is Partnership Unpacked, your go-to guide to growing your business through partnerships quickly. I'm your host, Mike Alton, and each episode unpacks the winning strategies and latest trends from influencer marketing to brand partnerships and ideas that you can apply to your own business to grow exponentially. And now, the rest of today's episode. Welcome back to Partnership Unpacked, where I selfishly use this time to pick the brains of experts at strategic partnerships, channel programs, influencer marketing, affiliates, and relationship building. Oh, and you get to learn too. Subscribe to learn how you can amplify your growth strategy with a solid takeaway every episode from partnership experts in the industry. Now, we talked in a previous episode about building agency partner programs and the idea of using resellers to grow our businesses as a topic I wanted to dig into more. How do we structure these programs? How do we expand into new regions? How do we measure success? I've got so many questions. And what better way to learn than to talk to someone who's been there from the beginning with a tech company like Snap. Max Rivera joined Snap at an early stage to launch the international expansion practice before the company's IPO. He's led high-performing global teams and launched the business across new markets in Latin America, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Today, he's leading some of the largest business partnerships, and he's also an angel investor and a board member for startups in emerging technology sectors. Hey, Max, welcome to the show. Mike, thanks for thanks for having me. Absolutely. So glad you can be here. And I always like to let my audience kind of understand how you got into this because they may not know you like I do. So could you start by just explaining how you even got started with partnerships in the first place? Yeah, I would say it was not necessarily by design or, or intentional. I didn't necessarily kind of draw a master plan and, and had partnerships on my aim or in my target. My background was in, in agencies advertising agency specifically i started within an agency uh, that's part of the publicist group here in new york and essentially agencies are as you very well know client servicing first and foremost and so i had only two really large clients that i focused on and worked on and those relationships more than just clients are true partnerships although they're not sometimes called that or, or is not necessarily thought of as a partnership role per se but they're very much kind of partnership driven and it's all about you know deepening that relationship and partnership with the, the specific clients. And so I kind of had that client servicing kind of experience within the agency side. Uh, and eventually, you know, Snap came on calling uh, at the time. Uh, again, it was an early stage, as you mentioned in the intro. So I kind of took a leap, leap of faith. I, I wasn't sure what I was signing myself up to. Mm-hmm. And I always joke that they really just try to find somebody that understood the Latin American market within the agency or advertising landscape. And that happened to to be me. The truth is that beyond being originally from Latin America and from an international country, I didn't really have a ton of experience working in Latin America, but they just kind of took a flyer as much as I was taking one. And, And Snap was looking for somebody that could help expand the business, but didn't want to take the risks of having to open up, you know, offices in every single you know, corner of the world. It was early stages for the company. As I mentioned, they were just opening up their main offices in New York and in London, Paris, you know, bigger, larger hubs, but they really had opportunities on consumer side. They had a ton of users that were part of the platform of Snapchat in all sort of parts of the world, right? It's a global product. And so they had a ton of uh, audience in, in Latin America specifically. And they realized that through partnerships, they can start to learn about the region, expand in, in the region, and start to understand what that opportunity really looks like in a much more kind of risk-free way. And so, you know, I was offered that role. It happened to be in, in, in partnerships. And the rest is history. Happy to go in through, in through what we get there. But that's kind of how I landed in a partnership role. Again, wasn't by design. Wasn't like I was specifically looking for partnerships. It just happened to be that the strategy of international expansion was partnerships led. And in seven years in, in into kind of a partnership role at Snap, 
I, I now have become a lover of partnerships and the power uh, behind partnerships and how it can help organizations scale. That is so cool and fascinating. And one of the things that I want to give you the opportunity to share is that, I mean, many of our agency listeners, many of our regular listeners, they're familiar with Snapchat as a social network, but I know a lot of agencies aren't leveraging it from a revenue perspective. They're not necessarily managing it for clients and that sort of thing. And how does Snap's business then come from partnerships? How are you generating revenue? Yeah, so 99% of the revenue that the company generates is advertising based, like many you know, social media or even you know, messaging companies, that's the primary source of, of revenue. And and you're, you're totally right. I think it is sometimes somewhat of a misunderstood platform, particularly because the age demographic of the user base of Snapchat, and then the you know marketing and advertising uh, industry, there's a big gap there. And so you know, there's a typical omen in advertising that agencies or marketing teams would buy billboard spots close to or in the routes of the executives at the company so they could see the advertisements, right? That's kind of like something that we don't have just because those CEO, CMOs, you know, high level, you know, executives maybe aren't the day to day users of Snapchat. And so they don't understand it as much. They don't see it in their everyday lives. But of course, they recognize that their target audience, whether it's millennials, young professionals, or even you know, Gen Z and teenagers on the younger side, they do realize through insights, through consumer research, that they're you know, present on the platform day in, day out. And so you know, in advertising, is not really rocket science. You're really looking for where the audience is and try to capture attention. And so as more and more marketers and advertisers realize that there's a ton of attention and uh, a massive opportunity to get in front of uh, users, they, they start to you know engage with us and, and buy different sorts of uh, campaigns and, and advertising within the platform. Very cool. Okay, so they're managing ad campaigns on behalf of their clients. That's really good to know. At Agora Pulse, we've got thousands, three, four, five thousand agencies that are using our platform for just general social media management. But we often have major, major events where we're trying to show our agencies how they can diversify their revenue and add more revenue streams by taking the clients they already have and saying, hey, did you know we could also do this? So I should be talking to all of them and saying, hey, many of your clients should be talking to audiences that are on SNAP because to your point, there's a demographic there that many of their clients are going to want to reach. If they don't quite understand yeah. it, I'm saying you've got programs in place to help them understand, you know, what are the differences or the nuances that are unique to that audience? Yeah. And we, you know, the company had that benefit also to be started their social media kind of had already existed. So there's a ton of things that they did on the consumer side from the very beginnings that were very different to what you know traditional social media was doing. And I use the word different here very purposeful because I don't want to bash or try to say that you know some of those things are negative per se, although there's been a ton of that in the news lately, right? And some of the negative effects perhaps of social media, but they're simply just like took a different approach. Things like not having public comments or follower accounts and all that, for instance, that's on the user side. But then on the brand and advertiser side of things, they also kind of took a different approach. One that perhaps is one of the reasons why maybe at Agora too, if you do more social media management, Snap didn't really offer an organic presence for for brands until very, very recently. And we're talking, you know, company just turned 12 years old this year. And so for the longest time, you know, brands were used to the model, I think Facebook pretty much started where... And brands would have an organic page and then eventually they would convince them, okay, why do you want to boost your page or boost your posts? That wasn't the case on Snap. We actually took a very different approach where we said, you know, you're welcome to engage with us from an advertising perspective. Like we only offered paid opportunities for brands. We wanted to really figure out and not just provide another organic page for them to manage, right? Because now that you have so many, if we really wanted to ask brands of that, we wanted to be careful around the value add and the differentiator that we could have if we were going to ask them to manage a whole new community and build an audience and have a page, all the stuff that happens kind of on the organic side of, of social media. And so that's very recent for us today. And so, yeah, a lot of brands, specifically if you're focused on social media management, perhaps haven't thought about Snapchat just because you couldn't really build that audience until very recently. And so now we can really play in both the social media management, community management side, as well as the paid advertising side. That's so fascinating to me. I went to school for history. And so I've kind of dubbed myself like this unofficial historian of social media. I've been blogging about social media for over a decade. Awesome. And, I, and I've watched platforms like Snap really develop and come into their own in terms of, hey, we've got this identity. And we are, to your point, different 
from everybody else. And here's why. I love the way that you articulated that. Now, I mentioned back at the beginning that I like to selfishly pick the brains of my experts. And that's not just something I say. It's quite true because yet at Core Pulse, we're talking about spinning up our own agency program as a true partner and reseller program. We don't technically have that now. We've got agency clients. And like you said, you know, there's some partnership relationships that can occur there, but it's not really documented and laid out as a reseller program. So I know you started building reseller teams, Latin America. How did you structure that kind of partnership? And was there any particular reason why they chose Latin America? Yeah, for sure. So I'll start maybe at towards the tail end of, of that question, right? Yeah. So so why Latin America uh, for us? And I think why I'll broaden the question to also say like why partnerships for international expansion, for instance, and Latin America is a really good example of it just because there is a lot of risk in operating in, in the region. And I don't mean, you know, I mean risk from a financial, from an effort prioritization standpoint. The region, I don't know the numbers exactly, but it's multiple countries, right? Uh, even though the language is primarily Spanish, obviously Brazil, which is a huge market within the region, is Portuguese. So that, you know, to throw in that. So when you're thinking about localization, of materials or of your product, your platform, all of that becomes challenging. Even within Spanish, there's different variations of Spanish through the region. That's only on the language side. Then you're talking about all countries having individual currencies. It doesn't have the benefit of Europe that mostly operates in, in euros, for instance. Each country has their own laws. Once you're operating, each country has different policies. They'll go through elections at different time, right? So you're really talking about a diverse, big region where the opportunity sometimes is is not as large, especially at the, at the early stages, or it might take longer for you to generate enough revenues to really justify a huge investment that would require to really be present throughout the region. And so working with resellers that, as you mentioned at the very top of, uh, of the podcast, already have a presence, already have a relationship with the clients there, that's on like that direct you know, client side. But they also understand the culture, they understand the laws, obviously speak the language, and so they can, you know, more than resale, they can also be great consultants for you to understand the region. And that's kind of what we set out to do. As much as we wanted to drive revenue and kind of uh, start to monetize the region, we also just wanted to, to gain learnings. So I would say that failure was almost, you know, part of what we had contemplated as a possibility and we being okay with it just because we were wanted to learn before really going in deeper. And I think, you know, that, that paid off for, for several reasons. You know, there's a, a lot of volatility that happened not just in the region, but with our platform during the time that we were launching. And so going the partnership route allowed us to have the flexibility that, that we needed. And so how did you actually structure those partnerships? I'll admit, I'm probably most familiar with Meta and how they work with mm -hmm. agencies, which for the most part, there really isn't a partnership at all. They know the agencies exist right. and the agencies will charge their clients to manage their ads. And Meta will typically charge the clients directly for ad placements. Right. And there's not a lot of go between between Meta and the agency itself. How, how is things right. different for you? Yeah, so in our case, we really, really took a true partnership approach where we just picked you know one player within the region. So we weren't you know, going to try to sign up a ton of different players or agencies, which is some of the challenge sometimes when you're at the scale of uh, bigger companies like, like Meta, as you mentioned. You know, we picked one partner that we really thought we can get behind and, and go deep with them that could give us what we needed. And one of the tenants that we had from the very beginning and, and then kind of became the formula is that we wanted to really make them feel like they were part of our company. We did a ton of efforts to have the individuals within the partnership. So not just at an organizational level, but at an individual level on the team. Those teams, you know, we sometimes would tell clients, this is your Snap team. You might see that their email address is not at snap.com, but you can treat them as they, they were. We said that internally as well with our stakeholders, different cross-functionals as we were maybe introducing them to the resellers or, you know, getting different levels of support. We would say they might not have access to all the tools or information that we have internally, but please consider them part of the team. So we were very intentional ab about that and really created that, that deep partnership together. So the way that we structure it, you know, it, although it wasn't exclusive, like I said, we really just focused on, on one partner from a resource standpoint. We just wanted to support one and, and go deep with them. And we tried to model like the team that we had internally at Snap and tried to recreate that model 
uh, with them. We help them with onboarding. Again, we really tried to mirror like everything that a Snap employee would get when we would hire a salesperson on our direct sales team. We would look at you know what kind of onboarding and training plan do they get? Can we get that level, same level of onboarding training to our reseller teams? So that approach you know really paid off and. I have to tell you, like the individuals that we hired, they really consider themselves Snap employees. Like when, you know, when they maybe moved on to other projects or had to leave, they were like, you know, I will always bleed yellow. Like they would always say that. And <laughs> when we met with clients too, clients would say it back to us. Like, I really feel like I'm like dealing with like you guys directly and, and not a third party. Like they really started to take within the marketplace. They were known as like the Snapchat person. So one of the, the things that we learned over time too, is to require our resellers to have people that worked exclusively on our product. We didn't want resellers that would just kind of go and open a briefcase and sell them Snapchat today. And then, you know, 30 minutes later, offer them something else. Like we had exclusive teams that were fully dedicated to us. Uh, They weren't large. Sometimes it was only one or two people and that was enough, but we really preferred to have one or two that were fully immersed in our platform and really felt like part of Snap as opposed to a big team that that maybe was just cross-selling and selling multiple things at once. That's so cool and so many great takeaways. And I love that you unknowingly mirrored exactly what that that other episode I mentioned at the top of the show. I had Franz Trump, who is with StreamYard and used to work with Hopin. And he was specifically talking about their agency program. And he said the same thing where he started with like five, six, seven agencies. And that's it. He wasn't trying to you know reach a thousand agencies out of the gate. Got to prove some concept, got to build up some workflows and build those relationships. And that takes time. So if we're going into it from that perspective, we're starting with a few agencies. We know it's going to take a little bit of time. How do we measure success for those initial partnerships? Yeah, you know, for for us, like I mentioned too, like learning was kind of baked in into our plan. We were you know, going into different regions and, you know, first and foremost, we wanted to understand the region. And so as much as we did have, obviously, you know, financial or like revenue KPIs, we also set out to learn different things around demand, about product market fit. And we were comfortable with also learning that potentially there wasn't a fit and there might be, like I said, maybe just failure, right? Like we were okay for, for you know, certain opportunities or markets to, to walk back if we learned that they weren't ready for our platform or we weren't ready for those markets. And so... I remember a lot of the conversations that we had with our partners at the at the very beginnings were, you know, being honest and transparent about that, right? And I think honesty is, you know, so important when you're starting a partnership to build that trust and being able to have, you know, those you know, hard conversations when they come, you know, setting the right expectations from the beginning and just being transparent and honest uh, really helps. And so, and we would tell our, our partners, you know, if you miss on our, you know, revenue targets or objectives, that's okay, right? Like eventually, like. You know, we'll we'll try to optimize things or, or kind of address those things, but as long as we're getting learnings in return, right? Like if we are not hitting some of those KPIs or, or goals that are more numerical or quantitative and financial, as long as we get the learnings, right? If we're not hitting those, and then we're also not knowing why, and we're also not understanding like why that's the case, or perhaps how we're going to solve it, or what we can try differently, then it's really, really a true failure that we would think like there might not be the right partner fit. But if they're maybe missing on some of the goals, but we're getting great learnings around like why we're getting great customer feedback, product feedback, and we're implementing solutions to try to address those problems, then we would consider that partnership a success, especially in those early stages. And so we said that on the, on the onset on some of those partnerships. And I want to clarify too, you know, when we're talking about these agencies or resellers that we'd use to expand internationally, we would hire them. So they, they were not just like a traditional agency where they're clients to you, like we would literally hire them, have a contract with them, you know, have you know revenue share agreements. And so we could really demand a lot of those partners. But even with that, you know, setup, we actually were very flexible and understanding that, you know, we're going in uncharted waters, opening up new countries and new regions is, is not easy, right? And so again, having those learning KPIs built in from the very beginning were important and making sure that the partners knew that because they're making investments too, right? And so for them, it's also important to get something in return. And so we tried to set KPIs that would meet both of our goals, not, not just ours as the client, as the ones that were paying and hiring them, but wanted to make sure that they were successful. And if they thought our partnership was successful, they would invest more in it as well. And so we set you know, mutual KPIs that would be mutually beneficial and, and not just selfish for, you know, for our goals as, uh, as the client or as the, the entity that was hiring them. 
That is so insightful. Friends, we're talking with Max Rivera from Snap about how to set up agency resellers to be a successful channel for your business. Here to kind of share with us another channel you might not be paying enough attention to is our CMO to Gorpals, Daryl Prale. It's the Arc de Triomphe. Can you imagine if you're in charge, if you're the CMO of Marketing Paris? What are your main channels? Wow, there's the Arc de Triomphe. There's the Eiffel Tower. There's the Louvre. Those are your channels you're going to use to drive tourism dollars in. Okay, now, but you're not the CMO of Paris. In fact, you're the CMO of your company, product, service. So what are your main channels? Well, I'm going to guess there are things like pay-per-click, maybe trade shows, events, maybe content. Those are all pretty predictable, right? Let me ask you this question. Are you treating social media as a main channel? By the way, only 1.8% of you today measure social media and can prove an ROI in that investment. HubSpot and Gartner say social media is the number one channel to invest in this year. Are you doing it? If not, I can tell you why. You're not doing it because you don't have the tools, you don't have the mentality, and that's okay. We've got you covered. You change the mentality, we'll give you the tools. Where Pulse tracks all the ROI for you. One place to manage all your social media activity, your number one channel, change your success. Treat social media as a channel, one CMO to another. My name is Daryl. I'm with Agora Pulse. I'll talk to you soon. All right, Max, this is so cool. I'm just so fascinated by this, this journey that you guys were on. And I want to know, you had started with a few agencies that you were doing you know, doing deep dives with, right? And, and building them and building the processes. How did you scale and expand the partnerships from those early resellers? And how long did that actually take you? Yeah, so we actually continue with that model. We're not, just the, the nature of the partnerships that we have, it doesn't really lend itself to, I think, scale, you know, too, too large. We basically scaled by adding new countries, essentially. So as we talked about it in the beginning, you know, we started with Latin America, we, you know, started with certain countries in Latin America. We expanded that to more countries within the region to really have full coverage. And then after we kind of proved out that formula and that that was a successful model for expansion, we actually just went and picked another region. You know, we did a lot of analysis to to make that decision right and understand where to go next and go and replicate that model with another set of partners in a new region. And so that, I think, happened in the second year or so. I think the endeavor that we did was very large because it was basically getting to global coverage eventually. That was like the goal. And it only took us, I would say, like probably up until last year or a couple of years ago. So about call it five years to really have nearly global coverage essentially through our partners. And in each you know big region, we have one or two partners that we've really dug in deep and stick with them for the long term. And so we really established our partnerships to be long-term partnerships. Yeah, again, like I mentioned, the nature of the partnership doesn't lend itself to have, you know, a ton of resellers necessarily covering that same market. We tried that at some points, like, you know, adding a second or third reseller that was going to go after that market and then trying to do kind of mar- market or channel design and splits. And that didn't really work out so well for us. Like Picking one and going deep with them proved to be the best model. And so we kind of applied that globally and like I mentioned today, now, you know, seven years, that's how long I've been at the company. So how long, you know, we've had that practice of international expansion. We pretty much have nearly global coverage, except one or two countries here and there, where there's maybe not enough opportunity or for regulatory reasons, we're not operating, but primarily, you know, have major coverage and, and most of the main markets around the world. And that's a combination of some of our direct sales teams and offices that we have around the world as well as these, you know, a network of uh, reseller uh, agencies that we partner with. See, this is why I love having these conversations. It's so inspiring to me to listen to you and the journey that you're on. It allows me to create a vision for where I may be able to go. And hopefully those of you listening, you're getting that same idea. We talked with Ty Radigan in a previous episode who did something very similar. He's with Partnership Leaders now, but he was with Optimizely before that. And he specifically talked about going into Korea and tapping into the Korean market. I've had people approaching me talking about having Gora Pulse go into South Africa. And what would that look like? And can I get on a plane and go to South Africa and figure out that market? That sounds fun to me. So Thank you for sharing all that, Max. (laughs) Right? What I'm really curious, and you can go into as much detail or not, totally up to you, but I'd love for you to share what your most successful partnership to date 
has been. Why was it successful? You know, maybe who it was, if you want to share that that detail, and how were you measuring success for that individual partnership? Yeah, I think one in particular comes to mind and stands out, and it's actually one of our most kind of longstanding partnerships. But the reason why I think it's the most successful to me, at least, that uh, this kind of like a personal answer. Yeah, it's because of the the human connection that we were able to make. So you know, people from this partnership I started, you know, many years ago. We've now our personal friends, and they're you know people from all over the world or across the pond and many miles, miles away. But we are you know close friends. I don't work on that partnership now anymore, for instance, and and we remain in close. And you know, we talk about our families and we connected. So to me, that has been one of the most successful partnerships because of that human connection. And I think the reason why I was also successful on the business side was for the very same reason, because I do think that oftentimes you forget that, you know, behind any partnership, there are these individuals, right? These like people, and they have their own goals, you know, personal and and professional goals as individuals, as much as there are like organizational goals. And so I think to me, it's been really successful just across partnerships. And you don't have to become best friends to all your partnerships for that to be success, <laughs> but at least to, to understand what are the personal agendas and what are the personal goals that that individual that you might be dealing with for that specific partnership, what are they looking for? As much as, you know, what is their organization going to look for and how can they look good and, and how can they accomplish those personal goals, right? So I'd like to either try to you know get to the root of that or, or try to understand that or just have that conversation openly to understand you know how do we make ourselves successful as individuals as well as our organizations that, that we're working with and so yeah this particular partnership that I have in mind and they were to listen they know exactly you know who, who I'm talking mm-hmm. about but it's one of our longest standing partnerships and again part of it sometimes was having tough conversations about you know, failures and things that didn't work out. So I don't necessarily mean that it was the most successful business or financial partnership per se, but it's definitely been the the most true partnership where you can have those conversations, where you can fail together, where you can scale back the partnerships at times, right? Or when you can say no to things and, and then still maintain that trust and still help each other. So I consider that one specifically, you know, uh, our most successful. And it's one that did also cover as many countries as possible. So from a coverage perspective, in terms of like the partnerships that, that we've been talking about here today, it was one like at the largest scale from a geographic perspective. I love that answer. We've had over 50 episodes of this show and longtime listeners know relationships are something that I bring into every single episode because I truly believe they're one of the most important aspects to partnerships, certainly also to our personal professional careers. We have to be mindful of the relationships that we're building. The network of people is our net worth, as has been said in many different times. So that's, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Max. What final advice would you share for other partnership leaders or maybe some pitfalls you suggest that they avoid? I think, I mean, I, I want to double down on what I just said here before, right? I think getting to that individual that's behind whatever partnership you're doing, I would say is is so important, really like kind of recognizing them as an individual, but also yourself, right? So I think just being really transparent. And Mike, I believe I was, I was remembering our first conversation just a couple of months ago, I think we got to that, right? I think I asked you, why are you doing this podcast, right? And I think you expressed yeah. it here, right? In terms of building your own relationships and kind of wanting to pick people's brains as, as you've done here today. And then you do so well in your other podcasts, right? So I think just, being very transparent about that, about you know wanting to learn about people's goals and like what they're trying to accomplish, sharing your own, and just getting that as quick as possible, I think is such a bedrock to to starting to build that trust and, and have those partnerships together. I think pitfalls personally that I've had that I would tell people to avoid, I try to remind myself to avoid as much times, is sometimes just to say no. Uh, I think it sometimes is one of like the toughest things, especially if you're very relationship driven or if you have these strong relationships already, like it becomes harder sometimes, right, to, to say no or to disappoint or to uh, not go forward with a project. And sometimes that's really the best for everyone. And we all know, I think, in our gut sometimes where something doesn't feel right or you're pushing too hard or you have so much or the rest of the organization can't get behind something. And so just being able to say no at times and having those tough conversations, I think it's just something that I try to remind myself a lot sometimes just because I am very motivated, can get very excited, can, you know, want to do many things. It's such an exciting time in the industry. And there's always so many opportunities, but having that ability to say no, and then focus on the things that you've said yes to, is just so important. And I think overall will help you have better relationships as opposed to committing to something, obviously, and then not being able to deliver or not doing with a full, full effort for it. And so I think that that's the advice and, and 
you know, pitfall to watch for. Terrific advice. Definitely be mindful of your time and, and that sort of thing and be ready to say no when it's just not a good fit. But I also love that you mentioned how important it is to be thinking about who you're talking to and your partner's goals, which means one has to ask, what are your goals? What are you hoping to accomplish, right? Don't go into a partnership meeting just solely thinking about what do I need to accomplish? Because we all have our own goals and, and that's great. We, we need those as, as guiding metrics, but we can't go into partnerships and relationships focused on ourselves and our own goals. So thanks for reiterating that. Max, you have been amazing. Thank you so much. Such a great interview. I know folks have gotten a ton out of it. Where can they reach out to you if they want to know more about you or how to work with you? I think probably LinkedIn is the best. I think it's my most personal social media. I always joke. The rest of my social media, it's all just like kind of random pictures. You'll, you won't find anything you know interesting or personal there. So LinkedIn, you can you know keep up to you know some of the work I'm doing and and uh, all, all that stuff. And it's the best place to just reach out if, if anybody wants to get in touch. Fantastic. Thanks. We will have Max's link in the show notes and Snap and everything. All the other references in today's episode, we'll have all those in the show notes. That's all we've got for today, friends. So please do me a favor. Find the podcast on Apple and drop us a review. Love to know what you think. Until next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Partnership Unpacked, hosted by Mike Alton and powered by Agora Pulse, the number one rated social media management solution, which you can learn more about at agorapulse.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast player. Be sure to leave us a review. Your feedback is important to us. And if you want to be part of our audience during live broadcasts, take a look at our calendar at agorapulse.com forward slash calendar. Until next time.